Hi, my name is Morgan Doremus, and I am joined today by the legendary Anne Rice. And I say legendary because really, you've been publishing since the mid-70s, and your That's book, right, yeah. especially Interview with the Vampire, I don't think there's ever been a hotter vampire <laughs> since, since, you know, Bram Stoker back in back in the day, and then right there is, is Anne Rice. How much from Dracula did you really take when you were crafting your supernatural creature? I didn't take any because I had never read Dracula. I had taken it out of the library when I was a kid, and it so scared me, just the first few pages, that I took it back to the library. I was hard. Also, it was a little difficult for me to read. I was probably about 12. And I hadn't read it. The only thing I knew about vampires came from old black and white movies, and the only one I'd seen was Dracula's Daughter, which was a, a very early sequel. And it was all about this very dramatic beautiful Countess Dracula, the daughter of the Count, who was cursed with vampirism but was really a painter, an artist. So I took that very um, beautiful concept of vampires as, as tragic creatures of great sensitivity, and that's what influenced Interview with the Vampire. Only years later did I read the original Dracula. Did it still scare you, at, older oh, yeah. as an adult? Oh yeah, the whole story of Jonathan Harker in that right. castle is so terrifying. <laughs> yeah, But I mean, Bram Stoker is, of course, the founder of all of modern vampire literature. He and, and Sheridan La Fanu with Carmilla. You know, those two works are completely seminal works. Well, I would definitely consider your Vampire Chronicles seminal, seminal works also because, you know, today we have the Twilights and, and there was a whole, you know, the Sookie Stackhouse, there, there's a right. whole revamping of the vampire. And I really feel like that was because of your books. It kind of got people back into that that mindset. And really, you know, paranormals are so hot today. Yeah. Um, did, you, did you know when you sat down to write that book, was that somewhere your mind was going? Or what really, what really made you want to, to delve into the supernatural? It, it was just personal obsession. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I wasn't really aware of how peculiar it was to write a book called Interview with the Vampire in which all the characters were vampires. I mean, I, I, I just went to the library and checked that nobody had done anything quite like it but um, and came home. You know, it just took a couple of hours, really, to check. There was not very much vampire literature then. And it was only when I went to get it published that I realized how strange it was when the rejections started coming and saying, we don't know what this is. You know, it doesn't seem to be comedy, doesn't seem to be satire. Well, what is it, you know? <laughs> but then finally, in fact, very, very quickly, a publisher loved it and published it. And that was my editor, Vic Victoria Wilson at Knopf, who just mm -hmm. got it completely, and, and I was off and running. But in those days, it was very hard to publish a serious vampire novel. We, we were ridiculed. We were disdained. Mm -hmm. And Interview with the Vampire in hardcover was flop. It didn't sell. People just didn't know what to make of this beautifully produced hardcover book on the serious fiction counter with the title Interview with the Vampire, and they didn't buy it. Now, in paperback, it became a bestseller, mm -hmm. and then it had another life as a sort of underground bestseller. But it was nothing like today. Today, really, the field is just wide open. I mean, it's wonderful. We're in a golden age of supernatural romance, uh, speculative fiction, costume drama, all of this is, I, I'd say, is it, we're in a golden age of it. It's, it. We've never had a time like this. It's a great time for writers who want to do anything in the supernatural or speculative or sci-fi field. Well, you took a little bit of time off um, to kind of discover other things that you wanted to write about. You did sure. some, you did some um, kind of a uh, metaphysical thrillers, things like that. But yeah. now you're back to to right. the paranormal creature because we have we have a shifter in in yes. your latest book. Can yes. you can you Ruben is your shifter? Well, he's actually not a shifter. You know, I've been thinking that that concept of the shape shifter is mm -hmm. wonderful, but he's really not magical like that. He actually morphs into <laughs> into morphs. a werewolf. So he's like, he, he grows morpher. the hair. <laughs> he he really has to worry about his clothes. It's not like Twilight where you can apparently turn into a wolf and then come back fully dressed, you know. <laughs> I sort of admire that. <laughs> I wish, I wish it worked that way. I'm always having the trouble of Ruben's clothes. They're back at the car, you know. He's got to, he's naked in the woods and it's, it's a problem. But um, I do want to get into pure shape-shifting creatures, you know, in the sequel, I think. Oh, the sequel, I, that was my next question, yeah. because I know you've talked about you weren't sure whether you were going to make um, that into a series no, with the, no. the wolf skip. Right, I, I held nothing back for a sequel. You mm -hmm. know, I, I wrote the book as completely, I left a certain question open at the end, because I thought that was 
the right thing to do for the end of the book to leave that question open. Mm -hmm. But nothing, I had to think about it. I had to meditate. I had to see if these characters stayed alive in my mind. And they have. Mm -hmm. And I'm very much thinking about the sequel and, and some other sorts of supernatural beings who will come in contact with Reuben and his fellow Morphin Kinder. Morphin Kinder. That is fantastic. I love to make up words like that. <laughs> <I like it. laughs> and we love to hear them because we start using the same ones. They, they become part of our vernacular. Yeah, great. I, I'm, I'm glad I had a lot of fun writing it. I really did. And I loved writing the love scenes in it. Mm -hmm. And I've noticed from the critics that people divide on the love scenes. If you right. don't think it's sexy to make make love to Reuben in wolf, man-wolf form, you're not going to like the book. But if you do think it's sexy, which I do, <laughs> you know, you might like it. And book. a lot of fans out there do. I, oh, I do. I mean, if a handsome, gorgeous man-wolf came into my backyard sing, <laughs> singing in the, in, in the starlight, you know, singing, and then came up on the porch and, and was gentle and kind, I would be very taken with him. Nothing so. wrong with that. No. <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> well, um, one thing that I've noticed with your writing is you tend to have your main characters be male. Yes. You, you know, Lestat, Reuben, your, your newest, and, and, and some in between. Like, we really do get male characters from you. Is that a a choice that you made, like a like purposeful choice, or is that just the way your writing develops? It's the way it develops. I mean, I, I don't know why it is. I just feel really comfortable writing from the male point of view and I can write from the female point of view and I have. I, I wrote a book Pandora all about the vampire Pandora and what she went through but it's not as easy for me. I just naturally go into the psyche of a male character and I think there's a virtue when you're a writer to going with those things. Mm -hmm. You don't ask why am I not writing about airline pilots? Why am I writing about vampires? Why am I writing about... You go with it because you get intensity there. You feel comfortable there. You're in the book that you want to live in. And I really like writing from Ruben's point of view. And I like presenting strong women like March at Nidek and, and Laura from the point, of, you know, within the story and Grace, Ruben's mother, you know, from the standpoint of Ruben. I enjoy that. Why is his morphine, why do you consider that a gift? Because you do label it as a gift, but there's also some maybe, you know, gift curse, same, you know, different different ends of the spectrum. But but there really is, there's some positives, but there's also definitely some negatives. Well, I, that was something I did want to consciously explore, the idea that it could be a very fun thing, a very wonderful thing, a very sensuous thing to become a werewolf. I didn't see why it had to be always presented in a negative light. Mm -hmm. Like to me, hair is very sensuous. It's mm -hmm. it's like it tingles. I mean, mm -hmm. how great would it be to have this delicious hair coming out all over you and giving you this marvelous insulation, you know? Mm -hmm. And yet you'd still have your you'd have enhanced eyesight and you'd feel yourself grow taller. Who who doesn't want to be taller and stronger? I mean, it, it to me, I thought, why wouldn't that be a sensuous thing to feel that empowerment? And and I deliberately tried to explore in that way. I, I had never really wanted to deal with werewolves um, because in so many of the old movies it is just a curse. I mean, I love Lon Chaney Jr. Oh, of you know, course, yeah. I love him beating his breast and, and <laughs> wishing, you know, that this was not happening and all of that. But um, where can that story end except with a silver bullet? I really, and also I had written about many regretful vampires. I really wanted to write about a young hero who's not going to be so... Uh, angst ridden. I mean, he likes this, you know. I mean, he's he's very concerned about the morality of it and, and concerned about survival, but he's frank with himself. I like this and I don't want it to go away. And he likes living with the other characters in the book who share this with him. One last thing that I wanted to ask you is I know that um, you just had another book optioned for a movie, and that is The Body Thief. Yes, and Tale of the Body Thief. Tale right. of the Body Thief. And this is, this is really exciting because this is actually going to be the third. It's the fourth book in, your, in the Vampire Chronicles, right. but it's going to be the third that is possibly going to be right. on, on the big screen now. It's been a while since we've seen, we've seen your books adapted. Mm -hmm. um, for this project, I know it's still very much in, in the beginning stages, yes. but can you talk a little bit about maybe in the meantime, since the last, you know, the last decade we saw, we saw you know, Brad Pitt and we saw uh, Tom, Tom Cruise, Cruise yeah. Yeah, embody that, um, what you really see for kind of maybe a new generation of, of people being able to see your mm -hmm. characters on the big screen? Screen. Mm -hmm. Well, I, you know, I don't know what will happen with the casting. I have no idea. Um, but I do think this that all producers today are much more conscious of pleasing the fans and the readers than they were 10 years ago. You know, 10 years ago, the, con the feeling prevailed in Hollywood that you could buy the property and pretty much ignore the readers mm -hmm. and do what you wanted with it. 
And that's not the way it is now. So whoever they do get to play these roles, they're going to care a lot about what the readers want. And I think they really know what they want with Lestat. They want somebody with, with charm and, and almost a mischievous quality. I mean, if it was somebody like Robert Downey Jr., I think it would be wonderful. I, th I think his depth as an actor, mm -hmm. his strength, mm -hmm. the, that humor, that, that, way, that, that terrific skill that he has would be infinitely more important, say, than getting a young guy 20 years of, of age who's Not a natural seasoned. blonde. Not seasoned, right, right. Right, I'd rather see somebody, a great actor like that, play Lestat with a lot of depth. And, and Robert Downey Jr. is, you know, in the um, Iron Man films. I mean, mm -hmm. he's, he's athletic, he's spry, he's wonderful. He'd be very convincing as an immortal. But I honestly don't know if he's going to be the one. I, I don't know what they're going to do. I hope Matt Bomer mm -hmm. is in there as Louis, if they have Louis in that movie. Now, you can make Tale of the Body Thief without Louis. He's not the main character. Mm -hmm. But I would love it if they would include him, and it would be Matt Bomer from White Collar, because I think he, he really gets... Um, that actor just looks to me like my character. And I know it, it, yeah. it can be hard for, for a writer because you, you live with these characters for so long right. and then suddenly it's kind of taken out of your hands a little bit right. and presented in a different way. Have you ever felt any anxiety about that, about letting your characters kind of go to somebody else, where oh, a director yeah. and a producer. Oh, yeah. I, I did, especially 10, 15 years ago. Mm -hmm. I was very concerned about it and and very uh, sensitive about it. And now I'm much calmer. I mean, I I know I can't control it. All I can do is remind them that of what the readers want, and they can come to my Facebook page and they can see what the readers want. You know, I can ask a question like, "What do you look for?" in Lestat on the screen, and I'll get a thousand answers within an hour. And and I hope the producers will avail themselves of that, but I don't know if they will. You know, you, you make a deal to let them do it, and, and you have to give up control. I mean, they're, they're not going to give a person like me control over a movie that they might spend $75 million on. They're just not going to do it. So, so these are good people, though. They're really good. It's Imagine Entertainment. It's Ron Howard. Brian Grazier is their mm -hmm. company, and Kurtzman and Orsi are involved, and I think they've done wonderful stuff with fantasy. I'm a real, real fan of Kurtzman. If I'm, and if I'm not mistaken, they did the reboot of the Star Trek. They is did. That? They did the young Star Trek mm -hmm. thing, and and they've all they also did a TV series called Alias, which was a lot of fun, and mm -hmm. they've done a whole lot of stuff, mm -hmm. and and I like them a lot, and I think they're very sensitive to what the fans want. Now, you have been quoted in saying that Lestat, he's one of those characters, when you ended, when you ended his stories and you said you weren't going to reform him, I'm wondering, after having a little bit of, of um, time away from him and working mm -hmm. on other projects and learning about other characters and delving into them, has anything come back for you for his character or are you, are you done with that? Is, that? is he over for now, for, at least for I you? Would say, I would not say he's over. Okay. I would not say he's over and I don't think he'll ever find reform to be easy. <laughs> Ooh, I love it. His gift is for survival <laughs> and rebellion. And just saying the hell with it. <laughs> you know, I'm going to survive and I'm going to do the best I can. And, you know, that's that's what he's about. So, Well, thank you so much for meeting. I keep saying this is the last question. I promise I won't ask any more. I'll let you go on to the next. We, we are at the RT convention and we want to say thank you so much for coming. And I know there's so many fans here that, that sure. can't wait to meet you. And Well, it's been a real pleasure talking to you. Thank you. And I'm, I'm loving being here. You can feel the friendliness and, and the outgoing quality of all the, the readers walking the halls. These are real book people, and I love them. We are. We're readers through and through. Yes, yes. Thank I you. Love it. Thank you very much.